We are six months into the president's tax cuts. Those cuts were supposed to trickle down to workers' paychecks. Instead, thus far, the biggest investments have been made in stock buybacks, nearly 700 billion bucks in the first two quarters. Politico reviewed data disclosed by the Securities and Exchange Commission filings. They found executives who got major paydays thanks to buybacks. Oracle Corporation CEO Safra Katz, she sold $250 million worth of shares in her company. That came after the company announced a $12 billion buyback. MasterCard CEO AJ Banga sold $44.4 million worth of stock just months after the company announced a $4 billion buyback. His was the largest single cash out by an executive of the company in at least 10 years. Eastman Chemical CEO Mark Costa sold 55,000 shares for $5.4 million two days after the company announced a $2 billion buyback. The corporate tax savings are bypassing workers and going straight into shareholders' pockets. And joining me now to discuss this and a whole lot more, Chairman and CEO of Steeple Financial, my friend Ron Koshevsky. Ron, make the case for me why stock buybacks work. When we got these major tax cuts, one of the ideas was companies were going to have cash freed up, they were going to reinvest it in the company, we would see wages go up, and thus far, when you think about what the priorities or who the stakeholders are for CEOs, they're shareholders and they're consumers, and we haven't really seen it hit the worker yet. Well, look, I, at Stiefel, we have to pay fair, competitive wages, we have to serve our communities, and we have to make our share price go up. That's my job, all right? Yeah. And so uh, that's what we do. And, uh, stock buybacks are a form of corporate finance. Uh, they need to be done like investments. You can buy back stocks, you can make investments, you can pay dividends. So to sit there and just link it completely to executive compensation, I think, is, is rather simplistic and not, not uh, the real issue here. Well, then what is the real issue? When you look at income inequality, when we saw these tax cuts, they were sold as it's going to help the American worker. Well, I think well, the American yeah. worker is because wages, they continue to stay relatively stagnant. Well, that's not true. They're just this week, the government said wages are the highest they've been in 10 years, and wages are growing 3%. Now, let me, let me do say this. They are looking at ECI data, and that's factoring in health care. That factors in a whole lot. But if you go to your average worker out there, they are not seeing wage increases. Amazon continues to have employees on food stamps. There are, wages are increasing. You can look at a lot of statistics, you know, the old adage of what statistics say. Everybody can say. find okay, data. Everyone can their find argument. data, right. <laughs> and so, uh, look, the economy's growing. Uh, wages are increasing, I believe, just uh, the simple 3% three over th three percent year over year. It's the highest uh, since the financial crisis. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see that. Now, I do want to say something, okay? The biggest issue, I think, economically in this country is income inequality. Yeah. So I'm going to agree with you on that. And there and we need to find policies to to narrow that and that and that runs the gamut from education to opportunity to a number of things and so I'm not I'm not gonna take issue with do that. you think we're doing things to address that because my reservation is this I look at the massive tax cuts and I look God the Treasury has less and less money they have to borrow more and we've got massive budget deficits and the president talks about a trade deficit but those budget deficits cause us to cut programs that people on the bottom who or suffering in this income inequality divide need. Well, you know, the interesting thing is if you want to say the budget deficits actually increase trade deficits if you want to get in economic terms, okay? But don't look, look, uh, we, we as a country, we as a society can do and should do a better job of narrowing income inequality. Okay, I, I think. Do you that think it's happening right now? Because I, the tax cuts aren't yet paid for, and now we've got this idea floated that we're going to now uh, inflation adjust capital gains tax. And while that might not be a bad idea, it certainly doesn't address the big problem, which is income inequality. Of course, but the first thing is jobs. Okay, so when jobs are at 3.7 percent, the economy is growing 4 percent, and I'm here all oh, not sustainable. All of these things, da da yada yada. Things are better, and as things are getting better, people are participating. Workforce participation went up. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's let's talk about some of the positive things. Are we going to take income inequality and at the end of this show make it go to zero? No. I don't think so. Of course okay. Not. Right. And one and one of the reasons people voted for the president is because he said, I'm going to address it, I'm going to attack it, I'm going to solve it. Do you see policies being put in place that solve it? Because right now it's actually corporate leaders who appear to be addressing it more than government leaders do. 
I think the policies of, you know, these are all political issues, all right, and in economic terms, and, and I don't agree with all the politics necessarily, but in economic terms, I think there are things being done. What's being done on trade in the long run is negotiation. In the long run, it will lower tariffs, it will lower barriers. It's just a different way to get there versus what other administrations did. That's one that's going to help. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of the things that we're talking about, which encourage investment and encourage employment, are steps in the direction to increase the prosperity of this country. It, it, it is. Uh, but there are some big issues. Uh, education, I will tell you, education is one of them. Without a doubt. The president says he's turned the economy around. So walk me through where we've been the last eight or ten years since the financial crisis. Do you think the president turned it around? Because I can't find anything that needed to be turned around. We were on a slow but positive path. Um, look, there's no, I don't know that any administration should take blame or guilt for turning anything around that they inherit or don't inherit. I, I think there's a long-term trend. Mm -hmm. However, since the financial crisis until just recently, we weren't growing at 2%. Correct. Compare that to 30 years of growing at 3%. That's one-third less GDP each year for 10 years. That is lost prosperity. So are we turning around 4% GDP? When's the last time you heard 4% GDP growth? Five times during the Obama administration. Okay, and, and did, you, did you say it was not sustainable then? I mean, the point is, the point is, is that we have 4% GDP. We have 3.7% unemployment. Uh, I think that the economy is moving in the right direction. So let's not confuse the politics with economic policy. Let's, at least I'd like to separate them. Without a doubt. When you look at the markets, do you feel like we continue to just be on a positive trajectory? Some people feel like it's those stock buybacks that are uh, keeping things afloat. They worry a little bit that we've been on this positive trajectory for such a long time. And with rates as low as they are, where's the cushion if we do have an economic downturn? Well, rates are being increased. Uh, you know, the Fed's is meeting today. Uh, it is. It is. We uh, Savers need rates to, to go up. Mm -hmm. uh, the economy uh, uh, is higher rates signify a stronger economy. So in many, in many ways, a lot of the things that you're talking about, the economy is on a good pace here, all right? And so go at policy and go at tweets and go at all of that. Just don't go at the economy because I think that's a bad argument right now. All right, Ron, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I don't need to go at well. anything. Uh, we would love to have a good day. We'd love to have a great economy. We'd love to have a great education system. I said it before. Every American wants to be socially free, financially secure, physically safe. I wouldn't be where I am today without those three things. So thank you very much. Thank you for being Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.